You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion across the autism community. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skabitsky. This week, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Dr. Petra Kern, a board-certified music therapist with over 28 years of experience. Dr. Kern has taught over 400 students, contributed to 84 publications, and has given over 160 presentations. On today's podcast, we'll talk about music therapy and how it might be able to help children on the autism spectrum. Dr. Kern is passionate about translating and disseminating research to make music for health and wellness accessible for those who could benefit from it. Dr. Kern, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Chef, for your interest in music therapy and inviting me to your podcast series. Oh, it is absolutely my pleasure. It's that I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen how much it helps in so many ways with the population, especially the autistic population, because that's the world that I'm involved with quite a bit. But I'd love to hear from you is how you got into not music therapy, but how did you get into music therapy with autistics and, and what drove that? Mm-hmm. You know, Jeff, what you probably don't know is that autism spectrum disorder is the most served population in music therapy around the world. Uh, we found this in a survey study I did with a colleague. So meaning uh, most, most likely a music therapist will have a person with autism on their caseload during their professional career. In my case, it was very early on, uh, about 20 years ago when I was a research scholar at the UNC's Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. And my advisor, Dr. Mark Vollery and Dr. Gary Massiboff from the division TEACH, they received a research grant, a national research grant, uh, to find out how to best include young children, very young children, uh, in preschool settings. So this was 20 years ago when we had no data about this. There was no writing about this. And Dr. Watery said, let's see what you can find out with music therapy and what would you do to help children to be included in that setting. And so one day I was out on the playground <laughs> and I was actually working with a child with visual impairments. And what we did, we built a sound path around the playground with different music stations so that the child could trail around from sound to sound and then engage with the other children in meaningful play and interactions with those sound stations. And what I observed was that those young children with autism were all trailing around the track as well and were engaging with those music stations. And I thought, well, there is something about it. We need to do a little bit more. What could we do to actually engage them more with their peers and have those interactions going? Because especially in the playground, there's usually not a structured uh, curriculum. (laughs) It's the free play. And they have not been involved in any meaningful activities, not wanting to go down the slide. We know about this with sensory issues, not wanting to be in the sandbox for sure, (laughs) but wanting to play the drums, wanting to play a honk the horn, a taxi stand and so forth. And so I came up with this idea to build an extra station, which was our music hut, an outdoor music center with drums and a gong and cymbals and all kinds of things. Uh, And I trained and peers uh, to play musically with those children with autism in the music hut. So I wrote individual songs, which supported the interactions and so forth. And when I saw all those children laughing, engaging, And I have one child with autism who started to hug and even kiss another peer. (laughs) I have it on video. I knew that I am on the right path and that is what I want to do. I think that's absolutely amazing is that how much music in general and music therapy brings about the social, the emotional, the cognitive, all the skills that you're needing to be able to, to kind of navigate and fulfill everything that you want in your life, but it, it creates almost the accessibility to it at times. And I want to get into that a little bit deeper, but 
you've done a wonderful job of disseminating information. And I know that we have talked about, you know, the, the need for integration, the need for collaboration, the need for everybody to really understand how all these sciences fit together. Is that happening right now? I mean, is there enough of that bridge Mm. Or do you feel like sometimes like you're, you personally have to do a lot of that work and we need to be able to support that same voice that you have in the community? Mm -hmm. Well, first I want to say, you know, as other healthcare providers, we are part of the interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary team in working with uh, individuals with autism and their families. So in this regard, we are respected in part of the bigger picture of serving uh, the same population. Yet, I think the understanding there, there's a still a lot of advocacy going on for music therapy. And I'm so glad, Jeff, that you reached out to me. So this is actually very promising that you and your company are reaching out and wanting to know more about it and disseminating the work about music therapy as well, again, for your podcast, to your listeners. Uh, however, yes, I think there's still some skepsis about it. And I think it's just because people don't know that we are an evidence-based practice. There is data behind, there is science behind, and it's not just a bunch of people singing songs with young children. <laughs> now, it's, it's weird that, that you almost have to go and explain that to people because the literature is out there and it's just, it's helping to educate on how to use it, how to incorporate it, how to make it a part of a treatment model and a treatment plan that others might be embedding into their treatment too. And I think that there is that engagement across disciplines that's so important. But if I'm correct, is that is that you're going to try and put me on the spot right uh, now with the true false yes. game? And I don't know, I don't know what I'm walking into right now. No, but this it might is be for trouble. you and all the listeners who are listening to this podcast right now. It's actually not about data. I just want to know about your experience and you already, you know, you already uh, talked about your experiences with music and how it can affect all parts of our lives, all the developmental domains, so to speak, in, in our story of uh, therapy. But uh, I just told you that story in the beginning because it is a great demonstration, as you said, for inclusion practice. And so my first statement would be, all children like music. So in your experience, Jeff, and all our listeners here, is that a true or false statement for you? Ah, such a tough question. Do all children like music? Mm -hmm. I would imagine, and, and so now here is where I can't do a true false. I'm going to say true, but can I give a, can I give a, a rationale to this? Yep. I think all children like some aspect of what music brings. It's that not all children are going to like music in the way that I would say they like specific songs, uh, specific beats, specific, but what music actually brings, I think that they all in, inherently like. So I'll go true. Am I mm -hmm. wrong or right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm not asking this true and false uh, in terms of data behind. I'm asking for you and your experience, right? So, Yes, I think you know all children like to sing. We see this all the time. You know, they walk around and they sing about their environment. They make up songs. Uh, they improvise. Um, they tone and so forth. They use rhymes. They dance. You can barely hold children in a chair if there's music on. They like to play instruments and listen uh, to music during daily activities. Right? Uh, is it the Sesame Show or anything else? There, it's all music enhanced. My next true or false, again, you experience, uh, Jeff, all children can make music. You say can make music? Mm -hmm. uh, that, I, I would say that's an absolute true. I think yes. that all, all children have that ability. Yes, regardless of abilities, the cultural background, socioeconomic status, all children can participate in a broad range of music activities within their homes, in schools and communities, so in all environments. And then my final question for you, again, uh, experience question. Um, music has many useful functions of daily life. Is that true or false? Oh, I think that's an ob obvious yes for me, is that that's mm -hmm. true. Um, and I think that it, there are so many hidden values to music that hopefully you're going to be able to unhide. Yes. <laughs> and is an example coming to your mind how music 
is a useful functioning, usefully functioning skill in daily life. Yeah, I think uh, I think socially is that it, it it takes away some inhibition. I think cognitively it allows us to be able to structure our thoughts a little bit differently. I think emotionally, it helps us to be able to engage or or understand where we're at at any given time. I think that there's so many variables that music brings in, and it's and it's figuring out how to functionally use it and teaching people how to do it, that becomes important. And I imagine that's 90% of your role as a music therapist is empowering others. Right. And you're doing great. You're giving already the explanation. So this is my assessment of your knowledge <laughs> so that I'm knowing where I'm going here. But, you know, also music uh, fuse activities in daily lives, right? We know this all about the bell signaling a transition or you know, knowing now it's the end of a class or there's the train coming. So all the musical cues are actually structuring our daily life, right? Uh, music can also be used as a prompt of sequencing. So think about helping to memorize hand washing or other daily living activities. Uh, you talked about all the developmental areas about taking turns in playing an instrument with peers, right? Um, but also music can distract from undesired behaviors. So dance to music to avoid a tantrum, <laughs> right? Or it can be used as a reinforcer for positive behavior. And so we could offer a tangible nonverbal uh, item like playing with the music app as a reward. Uh, and it can also stimulate uh, uh, a relaxing environment by listening to relaxing music. So, so you see, in music therapy, we systematically use the music to make this all happen pending on the needs of our client. I, I love the way that you describe that there. Is that I, and uh, my, my daughter hates it when I do this, but I'm going to share a story right now anyways. <laughs> but when she's getting frustrated out in the community, when it's something where she has an immediate emotional response, she has identified that if I turn on music right now and it helps me to regulate, it helps me to process, and it helps me to think through my responding rather than just being impulsive. So a lot of what you're describing, it, it bridges the gap. I mean, it's not just autistic individuals that benefit from music therapy. It's, it's the whole spectrum of people that benefit. And, but it does bring me back to the question. I'm going to put this on you now, but what, what is music therapy? It, it's the definition of it is, has got to be broad by nature. Yes. But I'd love to hear what it is. And especially to the autistic population is because that's who we're talking about today. Right, right, right. Uh, just one step back, and you said it actually so beautiful, you made my point. What I wanted to say with the true false for you is music is for everyone. It's it, regardless of ability. So everyone else, all children with autism or people on the autism spectrum lifelong enjoy music and have a relationship to it and can interact through that experience of music making. So in fact, we know from research that uh, children with autism and uh, have typical or enhanced musical aptitudes. So there is no disability in musicality, so to speak. Okay, so it is something where we can all connect and be on the same level of interacting with each other. This is why I think I have the best job in the world. <laughs> oh, it, 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 and it's a fun job. I mean, it's, it's easy to be able to kind of go and work with a giant smile on your face, oh. where not only do you get to empower people, but you get to do it in such an energetic and fun and motivating way. But how, how, I, is, how, is, how is music therapy, how is music the tool for therapy mm. being well, used. Yes, so you asked me for the definition and you know, there are whole books on defining music therapy and there are whole official definitions of the American Music Therapy Association or the World Federation of Music Therapy. But you know, just in easy words that how I would describe it is, uh, so music therapy is the intentional use of music and the elements of music like rhythm or the melody to achieve therapeutic goals and done in a systematic manner. Is that simple, easy enough to understand? Oh, I, I, I love that. <laughs> I love that explanation because I mean, 
it's sometimes is that we get caught up trying to give this very complex scientific definition and, and we lose who it is that we really want to explain it to. And the way that you're putting it right there, it's simplistic, but powerful. Thank you. It's, it's really emphasizing those pieces. And you, you had mentioned that, you know, it's, it's through, through play therapy, through in your initial work with, with the teach program is that there, there's got to be some semi-structure potentially to how it's being done where nobody realizes that's going through the musical therapy part, especially with young children, that they're engaged in therapy. They're engaged in music, I would imagine. So what does that look like? How does that feel as a therapist? Mm -hmm. So this is what we get in the training as music therapists. Uh, it's as every other healthcare profession, we are going through a therapeutic process. So it starts out with the referral process, followed by the assessment, intervention planning, documentation. What else do we do? Ev evaluation. And then, of course, the termination of service. That, that's the structure in itself of the whole therapeutic service we provide. But then, you know, within a music therapy session, we engage uh, the clients in singing and chanting and rhyming, instrument play, music to movement, music improvisation, listening to music, digital music activities have become very important since we're doing also telepractice now and also songwriting. So we call those music therapy techniques and my students, they'll learn them uh, individually and apply them to different population and you know how, how the instructions are gonna happen then within a session. Now for children with autism, we typically follow a structure and a very predictable routine as we know from the research that this is how how it's uh, easy for them to function and follow along and know what to expect. And usually a session starts with a hello song <laughs> and ends with a goodbye song. Do you wanna listen to a hello song? And then I can talk a little bit about how we structure that. Let's do it. Yeah, okay. Let's pull the song for you. So this is a good morning song. It has been written uh, by my students uh, during an exchange program we had with some Polish students. And what you will hear in that song, Jeff. So, so this is the magic here. People think, oh, it's just a little children's song and it's two minutes long. But what happens in the song is amazing. This is all what you write on IP goals, right? So the first thing you're gonna hear is, um, how you start a conversation. The next one you hear is how to make a choice. And then the other one is an improvisation part where they can express themselves all in two minutes. <laughs> Let's listen to it. So this gives you a little idea. I hope you heard it, Jeff. Uh, but you see it, the first part of the song is, uh, hi, good morning, how are you today? So this is a conversation starter to give a response within the music, but you can say it verbally. You don't have to actually sing it because we don't want to have uh, our clients sing for the rest of their lives, which is cute when you're a child, but not so cute when you're an adult. <laughs> so, you know, practicing that's then choice making, what instrument do you want to play, right? So that could be uh, supported by a visual support system on a digital device with the different instruments to uh, choose from, right? Uh, and then the, the final part is the improvisational part where they can play their drums freely, or even you can work on some um, language skills like the ba 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 
ba ba ba ba ba ba but you could also say do do or whatever and work this in so you have four goals to address by singing one tool and that, uh, one song and i think that's it, it's why it's also a great tool for generalization because you can teach this to parents the early childhood educators and the whole transdisciplinary team which we were talking earlier about uh, to use all the same song for those purposes. Yeah, you know, the way that you internalize a lot of this over time, and you'd said generalizing, it's, it's how do I take this skill and move it on into daily life without it being me living the life of a musical? Nobody wants me living the life of a musical. Uh, they've heard me talk before. It needs to end there. But, uh, <laughs> the, but the, uh, the fact that you can internalize pieces and know when to use it is so important. Um, it, how do parents take to being able to incorporate what you're doing outside of a session? Is that, is, is that part of what would happen in music therapy is that you're working with the, the caregiver, the parent to be able to empower them on how to be able to continue that progress? Absolutely. And sometimes also the caregivers are our clients, especially in telepractice sessions. Now, when you're streaming into the homes, then basically the parent is the, facilitator of the therapy and working with the child while we are kind of coaching them through different strategies they can use uh, during daily life, uh, musical strategies they can use during do their daily life. So, I mean, this hello song could be practiced everywhere with, you know, with cousins and siblings and <laughs> everyone around. So that's a great uh, generalization here of, of different situations, people, um, times and so forth. Uh, we also look, you know, into what is actually going on in the home and are there different situations uh, we can help. Uh, could that be um, some self-help skill, skills from cleaning up to hand washing to toilet training? That all can be put into a sequence in a song through lyric substitution uh, so that you have this uh, in a song. But, you know, it's also beyond songs, I'm just talking about songs here because they're easy to hand over to another person, right? And they're nicely packaged, um, you know, and when we're talking about predictability, a song itself is so predictable because you know how long it is. There's a verse uh, and there's a chorus and <laughs> uh, there are the lyrics which are descriptive, almost like in a social story. You could even put the social story to music to social story. Um, so. There's so many combinations, but um, we also work with rhythm, you know, especially when we're talking about um, sensory processing or we're using instruments like the kabasa, which has those little beats on it and uh, stroke it over a hand for sensory uh, desensibilization and so many other ideas I could share with you. If you give me a clear example, I can give you an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the thing that you've hit twice now is accessibility. Whether that you had mentioned it earlier and the fact that you, that you now have a digital presence, which I think is amazing because it opens up the world to so many different people. But then also is that there's, there's ways to be able to package material so that families have a way to be able to continue treatment. On the digital therapy piece, how is that, it, is that, is that taking off? I mean, it sounds so needed to me. And access to care is probably one of my biggest passions. And I've seen it done well with diagnostics. I've seen it done well with other therapeutic models. I've seen it done well with emotional and social therapies. How does it look and how does it feel with music therapy? Well, I want to say during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, my colleagues certainly picked up on it. I mean, this is the way, this was the way to do it. Telepractice, coaching parents, uh, or streaming into a Head Start classroom and working with the children there. Or um, actually we did a three-tiered model of service delivery. I have to say this, this is what we came up with. The first tier was about uh, curating materials that could have been like me, for instance, I would curate a playlist of songs which a parent or a teacher could use uh, like a session plan in their circle time or in, during home, right? It, it's a movement song. It's an uh, interaction song, something like that, right? Um, then the second one, we, uh, uh, we created original materials and put it into a 
Bitmochi classroom, for instance. Have you heard about them? <laughs> those are those digital classrooms where you can have all different digital content, videos, audio files on it, so that uh, our clients could access the content analog by themselves, like yep. a single book, right? A book or which you can read, but also sing along, right? Mm -hmm. um, all those resources have been created. And then the third tier was then the telepractice tier, mm -hmm. where we did direct services from coaching the parents to direct service with the clients, with the little ones. Um, and yes, I think it worked actually remarkably well, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I couldn't imagine it not working, but the one thing I think it also does is that it, it allows for more of the collaboration because finding times for practitioners always to be able to get together is it's hard it's needed i'm not going to say that it shouldn't be done but it's it's the one biggest challenge of interdisciplinary work is time right. time time how do you find that time um and i think that that allows the venue having some of that digital consult having some of that have you what, I guess I should just start with, what is the benefit of engaging music therapy into other therapeutic models? And then on that coaching piece, did the digital trail help out even more? Mm -hmm. So since you are an ABA specialist, let, let's focus on this for a second as an example. You know, I think it fits really well together. Uh, that could be a really nice merger. Um, I talked about it a little bit already. Music therapists actually, I did another survey study on uh, what approaches are music therapists actually using when they are working with uh, people on the autism spectrum and most of them using a behavioristic approach, uh, looking into the four core principles of um, task analysis, of positive reinforcement, uh, of uh, prompting and then generalization. And 91.2% use prompting in, in music therapy, you know, and that could be gesture prompting by conducting, right? It could be uh, visual prompting by having this on your digital device with a schedule or something like that. Um, it could be verbal prompt, prompting through voice and singing and so forth. So all of those are naturally embedded in the music therapy process, actually, right? If you think about task analysis, let's go back to the hand washing and COVID because I think that has been super important, a super important task all of a sudden again, <laughs> the hand washing procedure. Hand washing has so many different steps, right? And it has actually changed, I think, during COVID, adjusted because we wrapped every single finger and in between the finger and the thumb and all the things. So there's so many steps to memorize. Um, if we task analyze this, turn the water on, wet your head, get the soap, wet your hands, all those things, right? We're probably coming to 10 tasks, right? And in the right order, putting this to music, like a simple song, which children know, row your boat, turn, turn, turn it on, turn the water on, la, 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 turn the water on, get, get, get some soap, and you get the idea. You go through the procedure. It's easier to memorize because this is how we memorize content through melody, um, and then recall it in the situation again, can be used with everyone in the environment, across environments, <laughs> and so forth. So in this regards, it is a well blend. Um, we talked about positive reinforcement that could be um, a tangible item like a music app or music game afterwards. But, you know, it could be also something like a privilege, being the helper of um, passing out instruments, something like that. So we can talk the same language mm -hmm. <laughs> like you do because we're actually embedding this in our sessions intentionally as well. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I think the payoff comes is the fact that if we can all at almost get out of our own way at times and realize, hey, there's a piece here from this therapeutic model that is going to totally empower my patient. I need to reach out to the specialist, talk with them, get their feedback and now collaborate on the overall treatment plan because there's always pieces that somebody else can contribute. And it's just knowing that team model of care is so valuable. And it, it sounds like that's what you're preaching is, is trying to make sure that 
communication of this and us having to be so specific with our technical language doesn't interfere with the therapeutic model itself and realizing that there's always contributors and always trying to figure out how to benefit from one another. How does, how does a family know when or if music therapy would be appropriate to embed into their plan? Or, I mean, from what I'm hearing right now, we all benefit in some way. Yeah, I just want to say, Jeff, I think you said this really well about the collaboration. And I think what music therapy brings to all the therapies is, again, talking in, in ABA terms, if you do a preference assessment and the child is really responding well to music, this might be that one therapy you want to put on the plan as well. And that goes along with what you're asking me right now. So what would be the referral criteria of thinking about music therapy as an option for a child with autism? But I think you know, it's also important for pediatricians and educators and other service providers, not just the parents, because the parents are actually the best advocates for music therapy, because if they have seen this before, how their child responds to music, uh, they're actually the ones who make it happen. <laughs> it is more like our colleagues, like the pediatricians, and uh, as I said, the other specialists who probably would need to learn a little bit more, when is the time to think about music therapy as a referral? And there is actually a wonderful package that came out um, just uh, this year from the Affirm Group. I don't know if you have you seen it yet, uh, Jeff. It's the Music Mediated Intervention, now being an evidence-based practice. Uh, and this is a training model coming out of UNC in Chapel Hill of this whole group, uh, the National Professional Development of Autism Spectrum Disorder. And I'm just going to cite this because they did a great job of putting this together. Yes, no, when to do this uh, based on the literature out there. And so they say, does my child uh, respond positively to music or music-based activities like singing, dancing, or playing instruments? Yes or no, all right? Another question would be, does my child have any spontaneous music related behaviors like tapping or clapping or rhythmically uh, speaking, singing to themselves, preferring a certain song. Um, another one would be, does my, is there any daily routine where the child could practice their goals uh, where adding music would be appropriate? Um, so, and then has the, uh, child's team, including the family, brought up a musical abilities of the child, a preference of the child, and are there any interest in music therapy um, as a service for the child? Yeah, so those and, would be the questions we answer. I, and I think all of those are such valid questions. I'm glad that the research occurred on that and that you know, the University of North Carolina was able to get that put together. Because I think it takes away the skeptic. It takes away the person being like, well, I don't understand it. Because the way that you're, the way you've explained it today and the way that I think we all need to start talking about it is normalizing the fact that we all benefit from it. Children with autism or autistic children benefit maybe even more at times because they have a, a predisposition to some behaviors that, that allow for it to really emphasize development. And how do we embed it into our program? So I guess th that leads to the question is where, where are people finding these resources? Where can a parent find this resource? As a, as a mm -hmm. scholar is that you're gonna go to the journals, you're gonna read the research. As a parent, I'm not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. where do I go as a parent to get the research or to get this understanding and start the process? Mm -hmm. So I think that music mediated intervention package uh, that has been published and it's free for everyone accessible. Uh, it's certainly a great tool to look into it. Uh, but, you know, if you really want to look into more literature, uh, I co-edited a book. Uh, it's called Early Childhood Music Therapy and Autism Spectrum Disorder, Supporting Children and Their Families. And in this book, we included all scholars here in the United States who contributed to the knowledge base to keep that skepsis out of the process. Um, 
Last year, for instance, I hosted a webinar series of 10 webinars with those authors who gave updates of what you asked me, telepractice, how does this play now in? So you could watch them on demand as well. And episode number 10 is actually with a person, a self-advocate on the autism spectrum who became a music therapist <laughs> and made a career out of it. Um, Another resource would be myself. I have a consulting company and offer support to organizations and to childcare providers and families to embed effective music media interventions. And of course, there are so many other colleagues out there who do an excellent job in providing services to families. And if I may, I can do a couple of shout outs where people can look. Um, there is Michelle Lazar and her company. She's an artisan specialist and music therapist. And her company is called Tuned Into Learning. She also creates music-based materials that can be used in ABA interventions. Jasmine White and her company Voices Together in North Carolina, they're offering choirs uh, for people with autism, uh, therapeutic goals embedded it and researched. And then there's also Esther Thane at ET Music Therapy in Vancouver, Canada, but she is one of those ones who continues offering a telepractice sessions. And of course, there are the organizations, the American Music Therapy Association, and as well, the Certification Board for Music Therapists. And both of those websites list certified music therapists who are still in good standing with their certification and well-trained. Uh, and the listing is according to the area where you live and also the population they serve. And one more thing I wanted to uh, give you as a resource and also your listeners is a parent, uh, Mary Beth Moore. She is a parent advocate uh, and her company is called the Advocate Underground. <laughs> and she supports uh, families and was successful in getting music therapy as a service on their child's IP. And on that note, what many people also don't know, uh, music therapy is a related service under IDEA as actually confirmed by the US Department of Education. I that all of those resources are going to be so valuable to so many families. I appreciate the fact that you had uh, such a ability to be able to kind of bring them to light. Um, and for your book, I hope um, I, I do want to make sure that that links out there and that we'll make sure that that gets uh, that gets out to the to our listeners. And Thank to you. me personally, <laughs> after talking to you, it only peaks more kind of discovery that I need to be doing. So Thank you so much, Petra. I, I appreciate you coming on and I, and I appreciate you informing us on so many things that music can do in the therapeutic process. Welcome, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.